Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. <laughs> He's using his radio voice. We're trying to be subdued. <laughs> yeah. We can't get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Who says we have to be subdued anyway? This is the Morning Light Bible Study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Uh, it is a foggy day in Las Vegas. We can barely see out our window. We're about halfway through our ministry time here. Uh, Prophet Tim Fox is going to show up today and will be assisting us with the remainder of our connections and meetings uh, here. Uh, he should be flying in uh, in an hour or so. We uh, have our venti, <laughs> sugar-free vanilla latte from Starbucks downstairs just outside the elevator. Good morning, Michelle. And so we are just absolutely <clears throat> prepared to wade into Numbers chapter 32 today. It's got some tricky names in it today. I'm praying to do better with my pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> so Kitty, why don't you begin? Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to expect. You know, they say a good teacher he will tell you what he's going to tell you. He will tell you what he's going to say. He will say what he's going to t say, and then he will tell you what he said. That's, <laughs> no, seriously, that's a good, they say a good teacher, that's what he does. Today, this is what I'm going to say to you. Then he says what he's going to say to you, and then when he's done, he tells you, now this is what I told you. Good morning, friends. <laughs> so, today in... Numbers chapter 2, we're going to see a message about don't settle for second best. In this chapter, we find two tribes of Israel who decide they get a better idea than God, uh -oh. and they decide they don't want to go into Canaan land, but not because they're afraid of the giants, but oh no, it's better for us out here. <laughs> we know better than God. They, they want to settle on this side of Jordan. God had an inheritance for them, but circumstances and situations led them to believe that they were better off just settling for second best. We often find ourselves in less than perfect situations, but because we're tired, we're frustrated, we settled for second best, and we just want to quit trying. Uh, this is a deception. Life on any terms you're going to see is filled with challenge regardless of our decisions. Go first class all the way. Don't settle. Don't compromise. Amen. Don't twist your doctrine to justify a theology of unbelief as though God didn't really offer us life and life more abundantly. Amen. I always like to ask that question when I read John 10.10. 10. Now, does this verse to John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, does that describe uh, the uh, carbon footprint of your life? Does that describe the profile, the template of your life? God's template for your life is thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That you can have a little heaven to go to heaven in. And if there is a relationship, a financial situation, a health situation, uh, where you live, what you do, your station in life, well, everybody can't be blessed. Well, it's true. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. But then he followed, followed up through the Apostle Paul and said, however, I became poor so that you could be rich. It doesn't have to be any of you. Amen. That's true. And that's rich relationally, rich for people say, well, that's spiritual riches. Hmm. No, it's not. Because if you go find that verse in 2 Corinthians, it's in the middle of three chapters on finances. <laughs> where he's talking about the fact that, they, that the people complained uh, as though he was just trying to make merchandise of them. You're just claiming to be an apostle so you can get money from us. And, uh, and then he goes on to say how he robbed other churches because they knew, he knew they had an attitude about money. And so he went to other churches. He says, now I'm going to Corinth. You got to read between the lines what he said to them. He said, I'm going to Corinth, and those people have an issue with money, and I don't want to deal with that, so would you support me while I go and preach to the churches 
to the Christians in Corinth. And uh, and then he said, well, for, forgive me. He says, really, I didn't do you any favors. I robbed you of a blessing. I should have dealt with your attitude. But then he, he takes it back beyond just an issue of, of finances. He brought it down to uh, the redemption that Jesus wrought for us on the cross. He said, look, you got to understand, Jesus died. There was an aspect of the death of Jesus that specifically has to do with... Uh, temporal wealth temporal conditions of life mm -hmm. and if there's one area man people gild the lily of financial suffering and oh i'm i'm suffering for jesus i uh -huh. might be poor but i'm godly no <laughs> you're not because he doesn't receive that suffering he already yeah. took it one time yeah this is the god for all who lives in a city where the streets are built of gold his throne <laughs> is one solid uh, jasper jewel mm -hmm. his gates are of pearl uh, his foundations are precious stones. What is it about poverty that's godly? What is it about food stamps, welfare, used cars, and broke down houses that is anything godly? That's right. Oh, Brother Walden, you don't know what it is to suffer. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. I've spent far more time on public assistance at the food stamp office with my hat in my hand because I had kids to feed and no money coming in. I know I've spent more time in a food stamp office than I would dare say most of you. Uh, but there came a point that enough, you know, as the Lord said, <laughs> that that'll be enough of that. Amen. And God began to change things. And uh, and it, it, it wasn't God changing. God didn't change his mind. He just grew us up into a different way uh, of, of looking at things. God wants you to be blessed. Amen. Happy birthday, ladies. <laughs> There will be in your lifetime opportunities to settle for second best. Right. You know, the, the children of Israel, they've defeated all the kings of Midian in the previous chapter and the tribe of Gad and Reuben. They decide that the land they conquered, it's good enough uh, to raise cattle on and they want to settle there instead of going on to their possessions that God had for them. Uh, Reuben was the firstborn son and... Uh, we see now that, that Reuben's manifesting, you know, uh, the attitude, is it's the generations after him. Honey, if you would read uh, verses 1 through 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites, after where thou shalt be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spoke, spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto war. And let them go against the Midianites and avenge the Lord of the of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel shall ye send to the war. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand. Oh, no, honey, it's the, did I say thirty-one? I meant thirty-two. We're in thirty-two. Well, pardon me. <laughs> it's early. Let's see, i got to do the back yeah. thing. So, look, uh, press this. Oop. Move okay. you? There we go. Press that little button there. Next chapter. Yeah. It's you my, know, I thought it's, it's, it was my fault. I thought it sounded kind of familiar. That's was okay. He was yeah. sleepy. Yeah, the first five verses of Numbers <clears throat> chapter 32. And we'll begin again. <clears throat> now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazar and the, and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazar and Nimrah and Heshbon and Elah and Shebam and Nebo and Beon, <coughs> even the country, <coughs> pardon me, which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. So, you see their attitude, this is good enough. This is just good enough. You know, I, I hear people say, you know, I just don't believe in all this prosperity stuff. I'm doing okay like I am. Okay, well, just believe in prosperity, and let the prosperity come and give it all away to someone else, and you just keep living <laughs> at that lower level that you're so satisfied at. Oh, my. You see, it's, it's, it's good enough. They said, look around. This is a land for cattle. In other words, they weren't interested in change. 
You know, Kitty had someone in, in her life, and she asked him one time, she said, are you ever going to do anything more with your salvation? And he said, no, I'm, I'm just fine like I am. I'm just going to coast till Jesus comes. You know, there's one thing as a past, pastor in my life, and my father, when he was a pastor, uh, my dad always said he was not a very good pastor because he did not know how to march in place. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he always had great vision, uh, a, a greater uh, demonstration of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives, reaching out, not accepting the lost condition and the, the enemy working in our community. And, uh, and he left people with a divine frustration. He ruined them for the kingdom. And, uh, and in some ways that brings frustration because you're just not willing to settle. Uh, just not willing to settle and uh, you know uh, that's one thing I, I've been a pastor a long time but I've never been about green pastures and still waters mm -hmm. uh, it's about yes we need that we got to get refreshed but now let's uh, go charge hell with the water pistol let's go out and take uh, the world for the kingdom till the the testimony is the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God Amen. and his Christ and if Amen. you're just looking to survive just looking to uh, get into a holding pattern until Jesus comes. Uh, people like that don't hang around. They listen to five minutes of our teachings and they're out the door because it's not what they're about. But you know, there's a lot of folks out there that want God's highest and God's God's best. There will be many opportunities in your lifetime to settle for second best. And notice they had a better idea. They let their head kick in. Their head started talking them in to say, this is good enough. It's good enough. As a matter of fact, you're arrogant if you want anything more. How come you want anything more than what you've got? You, you're just being prideful. You need to repent. You know, I want everything that Jesus paid for. That's right. I want Jesus to get what he paid for in my life, and I want to get everything in my life that Jesus died for me to have. He became poor so that I could be rich. He took stripes on his body that I could be healed. He was rejected so I could be accepted. He was a man of sorrow so I could be a man of joy. Amen. I want everything that Jesus died. But you know what the religious spirit says? Oh, he suffered that we might follow him in his suffering as an example of how bad life is going to be mm -hmm. till Jesus comes. No way. And it's taught that way. And you will hear that. And it's taught as a way of ameliorating and comforting people in the midst of suffering instead of pointing them to a way to say it's not always going to be this way. Victory is at hand. You can walk out of the situation and, and, and have something different. Put your sights on. Don't it make your emotional investments in the way things are. Put your, your expectations on highest heart's desire, abundant the life and life more abundantly. That's why we say things are great and getting better when people go, how are you? Well, things are great and getting better. What else could possibly go right? Because mm -hmm. that's where we're pressing to. We're leaning into whatever God has for us that's next. It's always best. Now, it's interesting that Reuben was the firstborn. The, the tribe of Reuben was the firstborn tribe of Israel. And, and Reuben had a trait. When Jacob died, he prophesied over Reuben. And in Genesis 49.3, notice what he says about Reuben. And it's reflected in his generations now with Moses. Same compromising attitude. Reuben, you're my firstborn. In other words, Reuben, you don't know what you're capable of. You're capable of a whole lot more. He said, you are my might. You are the beginning of my strength. You are the excellency of dignity. You are the excellency of power. But, he said, you're unstable as water. And you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it. In other words, Reuben slept with his father's concubine. Now, now I want you to picture Reuben. He's in the camp with his family. Dad's not there. The concubine's there. She's looking really good. Now, the man has several wives. That's right. And he just passes through the camp, and it's just like a crime of opportunity. She was there. It was convenient. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Oh, my goodness. And he went into his father's concubine. Same attitude now generations later. Here we are. We're in the land. It's convenient. It fits what we what we uh, do for a living. Let's just settle for this. The same fornication. Hmm. The same lie. But it's all dressed up in this religious, logical, it makes sense. We're My just humbling goodness. ourselves. We will take this. That's okay. You go ahead and fight that battle. We'll just stay here and take, take this. Hmm. It's fornication. It's hmm. spiritual fornication. Wow. 
but yet it is dressed up in all this religious clothes and unfortunately the the it represents a very strong uh, characteristic of Christian culture we've gilded the lily of suffering and just we try to pacify people just just you know can't you just be happy with what you have no I want everything that God has for me Amen. you know it says Reuben was unstable as water uh, you ever hear the statement that water seeks its own level water settles at the at its lowest level Water doesn't climb any mountains. That's true. Water settles at its own level. It it if you're unstable as water, you live life at the lowest common denominator. And we see this reflected. Same mistakes Reuben made as a patriarch, the same things here we see reflected in the choice of the tribe of Reuben to stay behind and to not go on into Canaan. To the Reubenites, convenience and the nearest opportunity were too much of a temptation. I so appreciate Carolyn Budd uh, when she came to the conference on the 22nd. Mm -hmm. It was not convenient for Carolyn. No, Under the best of circumstances, it was not convenient for Carolyn to come to that conference. Mm -hmm. It was considerable expense. You're going to fly over from London. Uh, but not only that, there were things going in her life, on in her life. And there were people in her life that just weren't thrilled because they weren't they didn't see themselves as jumping on a plane and going to a conference in America so they can and of course there's a baseline assumption that they were more spiritual than Carolyn mm. so here here's how they thought I'm more spiritual than Carolyn and Carolyn's doing something I wouldn't do she must be deceived so and actually and not only that she breaks her toe nearly, in the midst of it nearly nearly she got back and got an x-ray and you know well god healed her. there was a, yeah she <laughs> was she was misdiagnosed in jesus name. and uh but but she came it was the bible says the people that do know their god will do exploits that's right. but everybody else that's armchair quarterback you know sitting back you gotta realize i'll make a statement many times i'll say limit your counselors amen now the bible does say there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors but what if your counselors are full of arrogance and unbelief what if your counselors are sitting back and there's like three agendas? There's what God says about the situation, what they think, and what's best for you. And so they sit back with this equation working in their head. Okay, uh, they're going through a really tough time. They've come to me for help. Now, I'm more spiritual than they are, and I have more faith than they do. Mm -hmm. So if I wouldn't, I wouldn't do what they're doing. I wouldn't make the decisions that they're making, so they must be in unbelief, presumption, and disobedience uh, because see if people aren't looking at you and seeing the lamb if you look at people and you don't see in them what God sees in them your counsel is worthless that's right and the majority of people around you let me tell you do not see you the way God sees you that's right. they have a baseline assumption that they're better than you are they have more faith than you do say brother Walden that's just negative no it's not mm -mm. it's pragmatic it's a, it's it's 53 years of experience yeah. in Christian culture and uh, are we mad at him? No, we're not mad at him. We're going to go find the nearest arrogant, opinionated person that thinks they know my life better than I do, and I'm going to give them a big wet kiss, and I'm going <laughs> to love them, no strings attached, and I'm going to, you know, we've had people get up in conferences. We were asked to come to a prophetic conference one time, and we flew out to the West Coast to do this conference. Lo and behold, there were two uh, apostles, quote, unquote, that were ahead of us and those two apostles knew we were prophets and they got up and repudiated the prophetic in no uncertain terms and boy kitty sitting there watching me in my face is like the little barber's pole it's turning <laughs> colors you know as my head spins and i'm praying in tongues and and i'm like okay god jonas god Yay, bless you jonas, see welcome and god tells me he says you know what you have to do don't you and so I got up in the third session after they completely castigated, repudiated, and, and put down uh, the prophetic. And I got up in the meetings and I main veined those two apostles. God gave me the secrets of their heart, things that had gone on <laughs> in their lives, even when they were little kids, circumstances, so dates, and situations. Mm -hmm. Completely <clears throat> spoke the positive blessing of God and told them, spoke to their potential. And I loved them. That's right. No strings attached. <laughs> 
Because love, love never fails. Love, to I wasn't going to smart I wasn't going to let that conference be a failure. And the only way I could get out of it was I'm going to have to love these people unconditionally, pour out the glory of God on their life, and then you know I get home and they're calling me. Now they never they never repudiated their ignorance. But, you know, here phone calls come and they want to know more about what it is God's More God's details. Says. So we have a God who's able uh, to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. But the Reubenites, man, the convenience and, and nearest opportunity, too much of a temptation. But not only that, <laughs> typical of an eldest child, they don't want to go it alone, so they influence the tribe of Gad to go with them. Yikes. Gad means a troop. So people are making unbelieving, compromising decisions, but they're insecure. So we got to get a whole bunch of people. We got to get a troop to go with us. Hmm. <laughs> but God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above more than we can ever ask or think. We need to be cautious about having an attitude in life like Reuben and Gad. Go for highest and best. Mm -hmm. Go first class all the way. Don't compromise. Don't rationalize away the blessing of God in your life or the destiny that God has planned for you. Now, honey, if you'd read uh, verse 6 through 15. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall you sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over to the land which the Lord has given them? Thus did your fathers, when I sent them to Kadesh Barnea to, the, to see the land, and for when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled at the same time, and he sware, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Moses, I'm sorry, to Abraham, <coughs> excuse me, unto Isaac and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, the son of Jeph... You, you, say it again. Jephthah. That guy. Uh, the Kenzanite. And Joshua, the son of Nun. For they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all that generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men, an argument... Oh, an augment... Yet their fierce, the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. For if ye turn away from him, after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all his people. So Moses wow. equates this rationalization of we'll just settle here with the twelve spies coming back with the, the ten of them with the <coughs> evil reports. reports. Hmm. It's just one of them is an overt rebel, the other one is a sweet rebel. One of them says, this ain't working, and God's not going to do what he said. The mm -hmm. other one says, we'll just, we'll just settle right here. We'll mm -hmm. just, it's okay, I'm, we're good. We'll, we'll just coast. Mm -hmm. we'll, stay, we'll stay on the, this side. You see how evil that is? The same unbelief that was in the DNA of their fathers, and their fathers bleached their bones in the wilderness. Right. Now the next generation, God's ready to bring them in, and here comes this insidious spirit of compromise. Moses sees the true motives of Gad and Reuben. It's the same thinking that caused their fathers to come back with the evil report. You know, I was, I was raised with the thinking, don't ever expect anything good to happen and you won't be disappointed. Now on the surface, you think about it, that's a very pragmatic statement because in life there are many setbacks. And there is a philosophy of life in Christianity that's not about overcoming it's not about highest and best first, but it's about coping and settling and getting by. Mm -hmm. I spent many years. Look, I remember in my life as a young man uh, in my 20s, I came out into the ministry. My very, pretty much my first adult job was as a full-time pastor. I was full of idealism. I had spent years studying the Bible. I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol. I was super idealistic. And I remember the year that my idealism died. Mm -hmm. I remember the year when I was dropped into the religious meat grinder and I was, and my heart was just crushed, trounced, ground up, spit out uh, by people 
who thought they knew better what God uh, was doing in my life than what God himself uh, knew. And I came out of that time and spent many years where my goal was simply survival. I went from from a powerful vision of what I, I knew God was going to do in my life. I said, hey, my goal this year, I would say in the new year, I just want to come out at the end of the year intact without any major losses. Mm-hmm. I was settling. <clears throat> God wants something more for you than this. Do not settle. Amen. You wonder, at t- you wonder many times why faith doesn't seem to work. Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, faith will not work on coping strategies if you just want to get by. You know, I just don't want the devil to, to uh, you know, devour my life with an open mouth. Well, that's, there's no faith in that statement. That it, it, faith does not work on a coping strategy. Faith does not work to say, I just want to get by. I just want to keep the lights on. I just want my food stamps to be approved. Look, that's not faith. Sometimes we focus our faith not on highest heart's desire, but on how we think God is going to do the things we're believing for. See, faith is about the end goal. God limits his sovereignty by promising you an end goal. He says, I'm going to meet all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is a limiting statement. He said, Philippians 4.19, I'm going to meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. So God has limited himself. He has not given himself the option. We give God the option of breaking his promise. Theology Mm -hmm. gives God the option of breaking his promise. Yes, God always answers prayer. Sometimes he says no. He will never say no to what the cross says yes to. He has limited himself to always saying yes. The promises of God in Christ are yea and amen. They are yes. God's default answer towards you is yes. His default posture towards you is to green light every project in your in your life. We think we have to overcome the reluctance of God uh, to uh, answer your prayer, even when we're standing on the clear cut promises of the Lord. But you don't have to overcome the reluctance of God to move in your life because he doesn't have any. Amen. The cross, the shed blood of Calvary, the only begotten hanging transfixed between heaven and earth, he is God's mission statement. He is God's statement of willingness. He's God's statement of intent to move and bless and deliver in every area of your life. And he gave his best. And because he gave his best, we get God's best. Amen. Go first class all the way. Luxury is the precondition. Think about it. Luxury is the base state of heaven. Think about heaven. It's from a religious standpoint, heaven is obscenely luxurious. <laughs> if someone started a television network and they designed the set to look like heaven, Not they nice. would be considered obscene. They would be considered an offense to the cross of Christ because the, the base state of heaven is first class all the way. Uh, the, the default condition is, is luxury. What part of, of uh, streets of gold, gates uh, of pearl, <laughs> foundations of every precious stone, what part of that <laughs> defines humility as lack, want, deprivation, and, and, and such like. Yeah, just need to raise our vision and see it the way God sees it on earth as it is in heaven. I want to talk about something that faith does. Faith is always a stepping stone to the next level of faith. So it's like at the time you're believing for something, it seems like a mountain, but it's not really. It's just another stepping stone to get you to the next mountain. And I have in my spirit, I just want to say this, um, Michelle's going to make a shift and get to Branson as God allows her to, and she's got faith out there. But Michelle, what if it's God saying, that's just a baby step, honey. We're going to go back to Guyana and we're going to preach the gospel to the nation. Let's just keep pressing in, sis, because that's what faith does. It goes from faith to faith and glory to glory. So think about it as your uh, building material to get to the next level and the next level that you're going. Yeah. And, and God will honor that. Now, again, sometimes we try to put our faith on how God is going to do what he promised. Like um, God said he was going to bless me. And I know he's going to bless me because he's going to give me this dream job or give me this promotion. In other words, God's going to bless me and this is how he's going to do it. (laughs) That is a total waste of faith. Because you put your faith on the end 
result. Right. But you leave the sovereignty of how God gets it done. You don't tell them how See, to do it. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, your, you know, my kids, they, they want me to do something for them, uh, but I'm an adult, they're children, and they got their own little kid ideas about how they think I'm going to get that done. But how I'm going to get it done, that's up to me. I made my children a promise. I'm going to do what I said, but they're not going to tell me how to get it done. But Amen. many times we put our faith upon who God's going to the use. The process, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we're trying to manipulate God where the process is concerned. And faith doesn't work for that. No. Faith doesn't work for second best. Faith doesn't work on a coping strategy. No. Faith doesn't work in trying to tell God how to, how to get it done. He says, I, how are you going to do that? He says, none of your business. I'm <laughs> God. I'm bigger than you are. And I know more. And you're not going to tell me. God is the, you know, I don't like A-type personalities. <laughs> God is a major A-type personality. And quite frankly, just as personality types go, I'm not talking about the love of God, but I'm saying just A-type personalities, when they're in the room, I just kind of back off Mm -hmm. and I sit back. (coughs) That's why I'm... (laughs) You'd think Brother Walton's weird. But I'm real real conservative about how I ask God questions because he loves to mess with my mind. (laughs) He waits for me to ask him questions. That's true. And when I ask him questions... You know, he always throws in these little zingers that will spin me off into some uh, 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 mind-blowing struggle to understand what he just said that lasts for 10 years. Because that's he's that way. He he's a Lord. The very first spirit of the seven spirits of God is the spirit of the Lord. That means he's one of those guys that walks into the room where everybody's having a perfectly good time of fellowship, and he comes into the room, and all of a sudden everything's about him. I mean, he takes all the oxygen out of the room. The focus has to be on him. He steps into a room, and he's holding court, baby. Mm-hmm. And everything that was going on before he walked in, everybody's having a good time. All that comes to an end. Mm-hmm. We think those people are a little bit obnoxious, don't we? <laughs> Not when it's God. <laughs> but this is the God who loves us, and it's his nature. That's why, oh, God, just get me out of this job. God, get me out of this town. He says, okay, let me remove every reason that you wanted to get out of this town, put your foot in the neck of your enemy, give you total and absolute victory, uh, fulfill your highest heart's desire, greatest dream fulfilled, take all the pressure off of ever doing it, then I'll ask you to do it as sacrificial obedience, not putting your tail between your legs and running. Come on, that's the truth. Because it's his nature. He never <laughs> walks away from a fight. <laughs> And I, I just, I don't like that about him. I just, you know. But we need him to be God, right? It's okay. I give him permission to be God because it works out pretty well. His, oh, his way of doing things just seems to come together. It's but, so much higher and better. Don't try to tell God how your life is going to be different or by what means God is going to work change. In your life, those things reveal false dependencies and assumptions that we make. His thoughts are not your thoughts. You could never conceive in your wildest imagination the path God will take to bring you to highest heart's desire and greatest dream fulfilled. Most people opt out right here. If they don't understand God, and God doesn't move in their life in a logical, rational, conventional, non-controversial way. <laughs> Don't be controversial, God. I've had, we've had people tell us, can I tell you how many people in the eight years we've been walking this walk? I don't have trouble with what you did. It's how you did it. And we're like, okay, well, go talk to God. Yeah. Because we did. They wanted us, oh, you had to admit you were wrong. No, I don't. God told me specifically never to admit that to those people mm-hmm. because they're carnal-minded. Mm-hmm. I said, look, I did what I saw the Father do. Amen, indeed. And if you don't like it, I don't like it, the devil doesn't like it, people around us don't like it, that's just too bad. Yeah, doesn't See? matter. Because I checked my intellect in the coat closet of the sovereignty of God many years ago. I like that, huh? And he has my permission to tell me to do things I don't understand because I trust He'll explain it later. Many times I'm like, just forget it. Because I know when he explains it, he's going to blow my mind, rock my world, and just make me lay awake for like five years. And so I'm like, <laughs> okay, I don't have to figure it out. It worked. I did what you said. Let's, let's move on. You know? A pattern of trust you've developed and, with him. <laughs> and I open my mouth to ask for an explanation, and he says, a simple thank you would suffice. <laughs> Most people opt out. They want something rational, non-controversial. And if they can't have it that way, they that's okay. I'll just coast. Mm-mm. 
Yes, I had some great dreams when I was young then, and this is the real world. Try coasting in the river of God. You end up going downstream. Read, uh, <laughs> if you'd read verses 16 through 22. Okay. And it came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and the cities of our li- for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed for before the children of Israel until we have brought them into the place, and our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return into our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on yonder side Jordan or forward because... Our inheritance is fallen to us on this side of Jordan eastward. And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and you and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out his enemies before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession for before the Lord. Now notice they made the point. They said, look, Moses, we already fought for this land. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to go fight again. So in other words, they were willing to fight for what they wanted, but they were not willing to fight for what God wanted. Right. God had a promise for them. He wanted them to go across Jordan. He had a possession for them. But they had already fought and won some gains that benefited them personally. And so they were willing to fight for that, what they wanted, what was in it for them, but they were not willing to fight for what God wanted. I hired a, a man as an assistant pastor one time. He wouldn't come to work on time. He was mealy-mouthed. He was money-grubbing. He was lazy. He would not take instruction. I would, I would, uh, I would ask him to do things, and he'd go out and do it his own way because he thought he knew better. Uh, he would come in the door and he would work while you know nine to five but then after he was gone uh, he wouldn't do anything over and above but yet the day came that he had his own ministry and he became a pastor and this guy man he the he split the heavens he rocked the earth he poured out his life like a drink offering. He did everything he could possibly do. He, he abandoned himself sacrificially to see his thing prosper. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't willing to be faithful in that which is another man's. And ultimately, he got the Bible says God will give you the desire of your heart, send leanness to your soul. God gave that man the largest full gospel church, much bigger than the church I pastored. And in two years, three years, it was taken away from him in a moment of time because he didn't allow he wasn't willing to pursue to abandon himself like when Moses is saying you're going to make this decision he said you need to understand you're going to have battles anyway they had to go fight anyway you may think that you're taking shortcuts in settling look I'm just tired of arguing I'm tired of arguing, I'm tired of struggling, I'm tired of reaching for this that doesn't seem to ever get any closer. I'm just going to settle. You need to realize you're going to have struggle no matter what. You're not going to avoid struggle. You're not going to avoid battles. The reason being is your best friend, God, loves to pick fights. He's one of the guys you would not want to go into a bar with. (laughs) I know that all y'all are real sanctified and you never went to bars. But, you know, when you were bar hopping, you remember the guy that, you know, he was your buddy, your friend, but, man, you did not want to go into a bar with this guy because, you know, it was going to be bail money in your pocket and, you know, going to the emergency room and getting stitched up because, he you know, he was a mean drunk and he was going to pick a fight. He was just sparring for a fight. I was that way when I was, man, I would get, <laughs> I'd get drunk when I was a, a bad boy and, and uh, I wasn't a very good fighter. And I had guys that really liked me. But I, but I would pick fights with them, and they would beat me senseless. And they would beg me to stay down. They would beg me. I said, I can't stay down. I'm called to preach. And I'm <laughs> drunk as I could be. <laughs> I can't stay down. I'm called to preach. And I'd get up, and they'd beat me senseless again. Please stay down. Dear We're tired Lord. of beating you up. <laughs> you know? And I was just that way. But, but God is one of those that he, he, it's his nature. He loves to war. He's the God of Sabaoth. 
He loves to go to war. And if you hang out with him, uh, don't expect not, not to get lacerations on your spiritual knuckles. Mm -hmm. Because that's just who he is. That's what he does. If someone crosses him, if the devil crosses him, mm -hmm. he's ready to get to, to go get him. And you know the first thing he does? He grabs you by the your <laughs> nape of your neck and he throws you in first. He says, here, I'm going to throw you in the midst of that. Uh, if you get overwhelmed, I, I got your back. We play till I win, <laughs> the Lord says. Huh? He's always saying And that. it's just how he is against the A-type personality of God. And, you know, I love it and I hate it. It's like <laughs> God. You know, he loves to put us in a place of challenge. And so he tells Reuben, hey, even though they're abandoning the very best that God had for them, here's the path of remediation. They were required to selflessly serve the needs of those around them. They had to go in and fight the battle for the other ten tribes. And what was he really doing? He was dealing with their problem all along. They didn't want to fight. Right. They didn't want. They wanted what they wanted. But God said, okay, the only way I'll give it to you is if you do the very thing you're trying to avoid. And uh, they were required to selflessly serve the needs of those around them. This speaks to us of the law of love. Job suffered greatly. But he was delivered when he got his mind off of his own troubles and made the love decision. Job 42.10. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Mm -hmm. Look, I understand the suffering of many of, of you. You suffer in your bodies. You suffer in your relationships. You struggle with poverty and lack. You struggle with generational denial of the very things God has promised us in his word. But there is a path of progress. There is a way out. But it is not found in shaking your head and saying, why is God doing this to me, or when is God going to make it different? While Job asked these questions, the struggle continued. When he finally gets his focus off of himself and his own sufferings, things began to change. Mm -hmm. Things are the way. I had a buddy of mine. Nine months, I had nine months of hell in my life. Nine months when I when I prayed to die. And nine months that I, I didn't want to live any longer. I had a friend of mine who was one of these obnoxious little short guys, you know, that, that uh, he would call me up and he would refuse to let me feel sorry for myself. He pushed me out of uh, uh, self-pity. He pushed me into the pulpit. He pushed me mm -hmm. to connect with people that I, if those of you that really know me know that I'm not really thrilled about meeting strangers. I'm a little bit shy, believe it or not. But uh, it's not easy for me to get in new situations. And, and this guy would just, he just pressured me for nine months. And during that nine months, I had doors of ministry open. I was being invited into apostolic councils in, in a very powerful men and women of God. God gave me favor, and they asked me to minister and preach. And I'm up there preaching, and tears running down my face. And they're saying, oh, look, it's the anointing. No, it wasn't the anointing. My heart was broken. <laughs> and it was some of the most prolific ministry time that I had my entire life and at the end of it God deposited it into my life this little five foot two bundle of absolute blessing that was the very thing that I so needed more than anything else and she sits on the couch next to, to me now because I had to get outside myself Amen. I had to quit thinking about what I didn't have and go out and obey so God first the kingdom <laughs> Things are the way they are because of what you're doing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. What you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. But you have to get out of your head knowledge and out of sense, ruled responses to life and simply obey the impetus of the Spirit who will lead you to breakthrough in manners that won't make sense to you but will change your life nonetheless. Now, if you'd read 23 through the end of the chapter, it's a long one, but... It, uh, Okay. That's our next point. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build you cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep, and do that which hath proceeded out of your mouth. And the, and the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spake against Moses, saying, Thy servants will do as my Lord commanded. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and our cattle shall be there in the cities of Gilead. Gilead? Gilead. Gilead. Gilead looks different than the other. Um, but thy servants will pass over every man armed for war before the Lord to 
to battle, as my Lord saith. So concerning Moses, command. So concerning them, Moses commanded Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the chief fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass with you over Jordan, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead. In other words, keep your eye on those guys. Uh, those people, compromisers. Mm -hmm. People that are willing to settle for second best. He's saying, hey, if you're a Caleb, you're a Joshua, mm. you better keep your eye on those people in your life. That's a good point. Go ahead. About the land of uh, Gilead for possession. But if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you uh, in the land of Canaan. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord hath said to thy servants, we will do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, that the possession of our inheritance on this side of Jordan may be ours. And Moses gave unto them even the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben unto half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Shihon, the king of the Amorites. Amorites, the king of Og, king of Bashan, the land with the cities thereof of the coast, even the cities of the country round about. And the children of Gad built Dibon, Dibon, and Atroth, and Aror, and Atroth, Shaph, Pan, and Jazer, <laughs> Jazer, that guy. Go ahead, do that. Beth, and Beth Nimrah and Beth Haran <laughs> built cities and folds for the sheep. And I need more coffee. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon and Elah and Kir Japheth. Mm -hmm. And Nebo. And Naomeon. <laughs> their and names Shimna. being changed. <laughs> Change them, Lord. And gave their names unto the cities which they built. And the children of Makar, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it and dispossessed the Amorites which was in it. And Moses gave Gilead unto Makar the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein. And Jair the son of Manasseh went and took the small towns thereof and called them what? Havoth Jair. Havoth Jair. And Noboth went and took Kenath, the villages thereof, and called it Nobah after his own name. Shoo! <laughs> so the point God is making through Moses is this. You're going to have battles in life. Better to reach for highest and best than to settle for second best. There's a saying that you will hear in Christian circles, <clears throat> don't pray for patience, you'll get tribulation. But Jesus made the statement, <clears throat> excuse me, in John 16:33, in this world you will have tribulation whether you pray for patience or not. <laughs> Jesus spoke of this in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 21, 19, he said, In your patience, possess your souls. James 1, 4, Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Uh, well, nobody's perfect. That's a lie. You can be perfect. If you will endure, see, Reuben and Gad lost patience. Oh, let's just settle. That's an impatient person. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. That's the works of the flesh. And we have gilded the lily of impatience and compromise by saying, you know, can't you just be happy? Can't you just settle? No, I won't settle until I have everything that Jesus died for. I do not want to get to heaven. My mama said when we get to heaven, we're going to look back and be ashamed that we live so far below our privileges. I want everything that Jesus died for. I want to suck the marrow out of life mm -hmm. until there's nothing left of this life but a dry and empty husk because I've totally capitalized on everything that God has promised yeah. us in life and I have completely done everything God ever called us to do and at the end of my life that I'll be like the guy on the high dive I'll just I won't go out with a whimper I'll go out on the end of that high dive and do a nice jackknife into the waters of eternity and go out <laughs> and do the things that he called us to do in in eternity thank you lord we don't like to live with imbalance in our life we don't like to believe that we are works in process on our way to the fulfillment of the promises of god so we come up with these coping strategies and doctrines of second best. We gild the lily of suffering and denial in our life with religious justifications as though it pleases God to deny us the very thing he's promised. 
We, invo we invent false assumptions about sickness and poverty and loss as though God engineered them for some higher purpose. This is all despicable lies originating in the pit of hell. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, He came that we might have life and life more abundantly. Don't settle. Don't compromise. One thing about it, hope hurts. You know, when I had the attitude, don't expect anything good to happen, you'll never be disappointed. I lived that way a lot of years. But let me tell you something. I was quite level. I was quite level. And when good things did happen, I wasn't expecting them. And so they were kind of a sweet surprise. And so it, it was just, that was a nice level place to live. But then there came a day at 50, 47 years of age, I wanted something. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I had to deal with my own capacity for fear. I had to deal with my own capacity for, for longing. I had to deal with the emotional implications of the emptiness of my life. And, and it was a total and complete upheaval. I saw my life come apart like a $2 watch. I saw my life decompiled by the hand of God because he was not willing for me to live without joy. Amen. And that's when I learned. You hear me talk about it. Uh, have no opinion. And those were the months and years that I learned how to relinquish the outcome, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. But the end of the matter was highest heart's desire. Go first class all the way. Don't settle. Don't compromise. God will bring you to highest heart's desire if you allow him to work in your life, even though you often don't understand and don't appreciate. I don't appreciate this, God. We had a friend of ours one time, they were like, really, God? Really, that was necessary? <laughs> the often painful process of delivering yourself from your own Pygmalion expectations. Wow, Father, we thank you. Thank you that you're you and there's none like you. Who is like unto you? There is none. Thank you for that. Thank you that you can take all, you don't take all the oxygen out of the room, Father God, but you fill the room with the breath of life and you fill our vessels as often as we'll come to you and be refilled daily and hour by hour and moment by moment. You breathe your breath into us again. Thank you for the privilege of being your children. How we love you, Father. How we adore you. How we worship and honor you. Thank you that you got a big, beautiful plan for our lives. And it includes today. That we go out today and make a difference in this earth, Father God. And we be seeking first the kingdom on every turn. Simply because the love of God abides in our hearts. And we, we just praise you. We bless you and we honor you. And we thank you, Father, for our family. In Jesus' name. Amen.